Officials just lost hope for what could have been a big boost to China's economy. This as Hong Kong's economy is reeling from a historic drop in the number of mainland visitors. An alliance of four countries in the Indo-Pacific area annoys the Chinese Communist Party. It's their response to China's harassment in several areas. To the South China Sea, the Philippines' loyalty has been swinging between two big countries. Its latest move changed the military balance in that area. China arrests the mother of a dissident virologist. She fled China to accuse Beijing of covering up the pandemic and manipulating the virus. And China's ambition is to shift from being a target market to a competitor through theft. But what has relations with China brought to Germany's car industry? Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo meets with the three nations that make up the Quad Alliance. The alliance's unifying goal is to achieve a free and open Indo-Pacific region, one that can't be achieved without tackling the threat from China. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo meeting with the foreign ministers of Japan, Australia and India. The four regional allies in the Indo-Pacific region seeking to boost ties and cooperation against a common threat, China's communist regime. As partners in this quad, it is more critical now than ever that we collaborate to protect our people and partners from the CCP's exploitation, corruption and coercion. Pompeo said the alliance was even more important since the pandemic exposed the authoritarian nature of the regime by covering up the virus and silencing those who tried to raise the alarm. The meeting in Tokyo is the first stop on Pompeo's East Asia visit. It's his first trip there since July 2019. The subsequent visits to Mongolia and South Korea cut from the schedule after the president's virus diagnosis. Whilst Pompeo called out the threat from China's regime, the other three counterparts avoided naming China directly. Prior to the Quad meeting, Pompeo met with Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga, who said his country had been pushing hard to realize a free and open Indo-Pacific region. He said he will be sure to continue working on this. On the meeting of the four regional allies in the Indo-Pacific region, Japan, Australia and India showed support for the U.S. in its dealings with the Chinese Communist Party. Japan's Foreign Minister Yoshimitsu Motegi appealed for a free and open Indo-Pacific framework. We, the four nations, share the same fundamental values of democracy, rule of law and a free economy. We, as responsible partners in the region, share a common goal to enhance a free and open international order abiding by the rules. Australia's Foreign Minister Maurice Payne echoed her Japanese counterpart by calling for, quote, commitment to working together, to promote an open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific. It's a diplomatic network that assists us as democracies to align ourselves in support of shared interests. We believe in a region governed by rules, not power. And India's Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jay Shankar listed all the aspects that the four countries would work on together. I look forward to our discussions today on important issues such as connectivity, infrastructure development, security, including counterterrorism, cyber and maritime security, health cooperation, and the stability and prosperity of the region. Following the talks, the four nations had confirmed they would advance with practical talks on infrastructure, cybersecurity, and other areas. Now we turn to Taiwan. Amid Beijing's growing aggression toward the region, questions are rising about whether the U.S. military would get involved if China attacks Taiwan. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has now shed light on a possible U.S. response. In an interview with Japanese newspaper Nikkei Asia Review, Pompeo reiterated that the U.S. seeks peace, but noted that bowing down is not a solution. He said, we are doing everything we can to reduce the tension there. It's been President Trump's mission all around the world. We look to bring peace, not conflict. But he added that the U.S. has come to recognize that appeasement's not the answer. Explaining that if one bends the knee each time the Chinese Communist Party takes action around the world, one will find themselves having to bend the knee with great frequency. For years, the U.S. has maintained what's called strategic ambiguity about whether to militarily intervene if China attacks the Democratic island.
But as the Chinese regime steps up its boldness, more are now calling for the U.S. to shift to strategic clarity, asking the country to clearly state that it will defend Taiwan. Now we look to one example of that boldness. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, has increased its military presence around the island Taiwan in the past few weeks. For 15 days straight, it sent fighter jets to the Taiwan Strait as an apparent form of harassment. Some of the aircraft also crossed the strait's midway line, entering Taiwan's air defense identification zone. The CCP claims democratic Taiwan as its own territory, a label the island has refused for decades. On Tuesday, Taiwan's parliament unanimously passed two resolutions related to China. One of them is aimed at resuming diplomatic relations with the United States. When the U.S. set up diplomatic relations with Communist China 50 years ago, it also cut off diplomatic ties with Taiwan. The other resolution urges Taiwan's government to request assistance from the U.S. diplomatically, economically and militarily when the CCP makes clear moves to target Taiwan. It also pushes for recognition of Beijing as a threat to the stability of the Western Pacific. And one more country is ignoring Chinese anger in terms of Taiwan. A Canadian warship has recently sailed through the sensitive Taiwan Strait. That's according to Taiwan's Defense Ministry's report on Saturday. The voyage came at a time of heightened military tension between China and Taiwan. China has stepped up its military activity around the island in the past few weeks. Canada's Navy has sailed through the Taiwan Strait before, including in September of last year. The U.S. Navy has also been conducting regular passages through the strait. China tends to denounce such sailings. In August, its military labeled the guided missile destroyer USS Mustin sailing through the strait an extremely dangerous move. China-Canada relations have soured since 2018, when Canada arrested Meng Wanzhou, the chief financial officer of Chinese telecoms giant Huawei Technologies. She was arrested on a warrant from the U.S. Washington charged her with bank fraud for misleading HSBC about Huawei's business dealings in Iran and causing the bank to break U.S. sanctions law. Beijing has demanded her release. Soon after Meng's detention, China arrested Canadian citizens Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, charged them with espionage. The two are still imprisoned in China. Now we turn to China's economy. Chinese authorities have hoped that consumer spending during the Golden Week holiday will boost up the economy. But so far, the data doesn't look good. The Golden Week holiday lasts for about a week from the beginning of October. After China was hit by the CCP virus, tourism spending during this holiday is seen as an important sign of economic recovery. But official data shows fewer people are traveling and spending during the holiday this year. For the first half of the week, tourist spending dropped by almost a third, and the number of tourists dropped over 20 percent. That's compared to the same period last year. And concern is also rising over the spread of the virus. In previous interviews, residents in different regions said the virus is still spreading in local areas. They accused authorities of a cover-up. And with hundreds of millions of tourists traveling during holiday season, the risk of infection could be further exacerbated. And in Hong Kong, the city is suffering from a loss of travelers from mainland China. Every year during the National Day Golden Week holiday, Chinese tourists pour into the region and boost its economy. But during the first half of the holiday this year, less than 1,000 travelers visited Hong Kong. That's almost a 100 percent drop compared to last year, when almost 600,000 people came. Hong Kong's travel restrictions also make it harder for visitors. Tourists from China are required to quarantine for 14 days upon arrival. One Hong Kong lawmaker who handles the tourism sector estimates the city lost nearly $300 million in tourism revenue just from Thursday to Sunday. 
Chinese authorities recently arrested the mother of a Chinese virologist. That's after the virologist accused Beijing of covering up the pandemic. Yan Li Meng confirmed her mother's arrest to the Epoch Times on Monday, but declined to provide further details. She was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Hong Kong before coming to the U.S. to seek asylum. Yin had worked at the university's public health lab. The lab conducts virus research for the World Health Organization. On December 31st last year, after Chinese authorities acknowledged dozens of infection cases in Wuhan, her supervisor asked her to conduct a secret investigation via her network in mainland China. The research, she said, led her to conclude that the situation was far more grim than Beijing had admitted. She soon began secretly delivering the information to the Western world. After she fled to the U.S. this April, Chinese authorities threatened her family in mainland China. Hong Kong police pried information about her from her friends by claiming she was involved in a criminal case. She recently released a paper claiming that the virus isn't of natural origin. The study hasn't yet been peer-reviewed. Twitter quickly banned her account after she announced the paper on Twitter. The Philippines' priority has always been swinging between its economic interest and its sovereign integrity. Thus, it's keeping on the sides of both the U.S. and China. Its latest move changed the military balance in the South China Sea. The relationship between China and the Philippines has gone through ups and downs for almost a decade. In its latest move, the Philippines distanced itself from China and allied more closely with the U.S. The change had a major impact on the dispute over the South China Sea. China and the Philippines have faced off in maritime border disputes for years. China has claimed almost the entire South China Sea as its own territory and has drawn what's called the Nine Dash Line to designate its claim. The line is drawn a mere 140 miles from the Philippines and includes a small contested island called the Scarborough Shoal. At the same time, the line lies over 400 miles from the nearest major Chinese landmass. In 2012, a naval standoff came to pass when both sides claimed sovereignty over the Scarborough Shoal and refused to withdraw. After two months of tension, a settlement was made with the help from the U.S. The Philippines withdrew its ships, but China maintained a presence there. Since Beijing refused to leave the area, then-president of the Philippines, Benigno Aquino III, filed an arbitration against China with the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands. Years later, in 2016, the Philippines won the case, but Beijing rejected the tribunal's ruling. Instead of protesting, the Philippines' new president, Rodrigo Duterte, set aside the territorial dispute. It was an effort to bring in the billions of dollars that China pledged in infrastructure investments to the country. But as Duterte showed goodwill to China, Beijing was busy building artificial lands on the South China Sea for military purposes. And on another occasion, early in 2014, it was reported that a Chinese vessel fired water cannons at Filipino fishermen. And years later, another Chinese ship rammed a Filipino boat. The collision sank the Filipino vessel and put the lives of its crew members at risk. But even then, Duterte claimed no one could stop China from fishing in Philippine waters. Some in the Philippines began to express anger toward Beijing and blame Duterte for selling their sovereignty. Despite the backlash, Duterte once joked that the Philippines could become a Chinese province. Earlier this year, Duterte terminated the visiting military forces agreement with the U.S., It signaled a break in the bilateral military alliance between them, warming Philippines-China relations instead. Though Duterte worked hard to please Beijing, the situation changed again in April when China created two districts. But according to a court ruling, the area actually belongs to the Philippines. And in May, China deployed ships to a disputed area. Chinese Coast Guards even threatened to seize Filipino fishermen's equipment. A month later, Duterte backpedaled, deciding not to terminate the military pact with the U.S. The Philippines government said it would maintain a long-standing alliance with the United States. Since then, the Philippines have adopted a tougher stance against Beijing. The country also protested against various issues, like the seizure of their fishermen's tools and China's aggression toward Filipino aircrafts flying across the South China Sea. Officials even shut down four stores for selling Chinese beauty products, featuring labels that identified the Philippine capital as a Chinese province. 
The Philippines also warned Beijing that the U.S. would get involved if China were to attack its navy. The strategy prevents China from completely taking over the South China Sea. Despite the conflicts, Duterte still seems reluctant to give up relations with China, like in hopes of receiving financial support or CCP virus vaccine doses. For one, he banned Filipino Navy from exercising joint maritime drills with the U.S. in the South China Sea, again as a refusal to enforce the Netherlands' ruling from years ago. His policies have extended to business, too. When the Philippines' foreign minister recommended against doing business with blacklisted Chinese companies, Duterte turned the proposal down. Sometimes he even appears to push deals with those Chinese companies. Some suspect Duterte's inconsistent behavior also stems from his desire to obtain virus vaccine doses. In a July address, Duterte said he pleaded with the Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping asking for the Philippines to be one of the first to receive vaccine doses when available. Considering the challenges Beijing is currently facing, many are questioning whether China can fulfill its promises. The Philippines' foreign policy appears to play both sides, while for now it's swinging toward the U.S. Reporting by Xu Wenhui in TD News. Now we return to the relationship between Germany's car industry and China. In part three of this special report, we'll look at exactly what Germany has gotten out of its ties to China. And China's aim to shift its role from a target market to a competitor. In April 2012, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and then Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao visited a Volkswagen factory in Germany. There, they witnessed a ceremony announcing a 25-year extension of the partnership between the German car maker and its Chinese joint venture partner firm. Three months later, Volkswagen found out that their Chinese partner had been systematically and repeatedly stealing automobile designs and technology from them. That's according to a report by German business newspaper Handelsblatt, citing multiple unnamed executives from Volkswagen. One called the copying of designs simply a disaster. In one example, Volkswagen executives told the paper that FAW stole the design for a transmission. The Chinese car maker then used the design to their own car model, which then exported to Russia and became Volkswagen's competition. The paper reported that by 2012, at least four Volkswagen patents valid in China had been infringed. In another case, FAW used a design for a Volkswagen four-cylinder engine for its own domestic brands. The only difference between the original engine and the copy was the company logo, as the Chinese car maker replaced the VW brand with their own. But Volkswagen isn't the only example. Much of the forged technology transfer and intellectual property theft experienced by Western firms in China happens via joint venture. Unlike investment in other countries, in China, foreign manufacturers are forced to establish a partnership with a local manufacturer. That's in order to enter the 1.4 billion population market. And until recently, China didn't allow foreign companies to hold more than 50 percent ownership of the joint venture. As for the theft, it's costly for car makers to openly challenge it. In 2018, out of the 10 million cars sold by Volkswagen worldwide, 4 million were sold in China. Most were produced by local joint ventures. Now, Beijing aims to shift from a partner to Western car makers to a competitor. According to a 2019 report by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce, Beijing aims to promote export of Chinese cars produced by joint ventures with European and American markets. It also adds that foreign companies should accelerate the transfer of modern technologies and localization even more to establish China as the global base for automotive development, purchases, production and exports. According to the report, China now ranks number sixth in market share for the automotive export industry. But it ranks second in terms of the Export Rise Advantage Index. The index for both the U.S. and Germany are negative. The German car industry is becoming more and more aware of the concern. A 2019 report by Germany's main industry lobby, BDI, argues that the West has failed to change China and that Beijing's economy isn't becoming more open like some democratic countries had hoped. 
The paper cites a range of problems for German firms operating in China, from forced technology transfer and failures to protect intellectual property. It called for a tougher approach on China, but also stressed that a general containment of China or decoupling is not an option. German industry advocates exchange and cooperation. The Chinese market helped Germany recover from the 2008 financial crisis. Now the industry is eyeing China to bail it out again. This May, Volkswagen decided to increase its stake in a joint venture in China, pouring another $2 billion in the China's electric car industry. In the preface of China's Commerce Ministry report, the member of party leadership group and assistant minister of the ministry wrote that the automotive industry is a strategic part of China's economy. He added that promoting high-quality trade development is a major decision and deployment made by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China in the face of profound changes in the international and domestic situations and an inevitable requirement for pushing forward the cause of socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.